Without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to tonight's speaker, Stephen Rowe. He's going to tell us about what would happen if the Earth had two suns. Oh. Thank you, Natalie. Can, can you all hear me okay? Okay, great. I feel like a bit of an android. I have like two, uh, one here, one here. I think one of them is for the camera over there. So just ignore this uh, on my right, or your, your right, my left. <laughs> um, so I'm Steven. I'm in my fifth year uh, of my PhD here at U of T. And I usually study shock waves and explosions, uh, especially how they propagate through a star. Uh, more of my recent work are, is trying to explore new novel ways to which we can explode stars to explain these unusual flares or explosions that we see um, in supernovae. Uh, but tonight, I'm going to talk about something a little different. I'm going to explore an alternate reality where the Earth has two suns instead of one. Now, the consequences may not seem too obvious. In fact, it may be first impression a little innocuous. Um, but I'm going to try my best to stretch your imagination and convince you that this is not an impossibility. And in fact, uh, in my opinion, I think it's a little unfortunate that we don't have a companion. Um, so why don't we start? Uh, I think the first sort of uh, primary example that we might think of, maybe, uh, when you think of a binary star or a, a planetary system with two stars, uh, is Tatooine, okay? This is Tatooine from Star Wars. This is where Luke and Anakin Skywalker grow up and become Jedis and things like that. Uh, and Tatooine orbits a binary star system, a solar system that has two stars, okay? Uh, this is a very popular science fiction example, but it's actually not the first example that comes to my mind. Uh, you might have seen uh, this slide, okay? Oh, I have to come closer. This slide. Okay, this is actually my favorite childhood TV show, uh, and to be completely honest, is the reason why I went to astronomy in the first place. Okay? Uh, in fact, it's not exactly uh, due to, let's say, all the crazy wormholes and space exploration. Uh, to be honest, it's because of Samantha Carter. She, uh, she has a PhD in theoretical astrophysics. She goes around wormholes carrying P90s and shooting aliens that believe that they're gods and freeing races and things like that. Uh, and tries to hack alien technology while she's on a tablet that like runs by Dell or something. Okay, <laughs> so it's it's really impressive. And I thought when I was 12 or 13, I thought, oh man, how do I become a theoretical astrophysicist? <laughs> and, uh, and so honestly, that's that's uh, here I am. Okay, <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not doing so bad. Hopefully, uh, I might have a future just as interesting as hers. Um, but uh, this is all sci-fi. And um, going back to the Stargate Universe. Um, this is the first example that I think of, actually. This is the planet Cholak. Okay, this is where the Jaffa Rebellion first began against the Gwauld. Okay, I believe they were false gods. And it's also a planetary system that has a binary star. Okay. Now, um, this is all science fiction so far. And uh, usually, much of science fiction is based on real science. And the first question I like to ask uh, as a scientist, is whether or not binary stars are real. Okay, do they actually exist? It turns out for about 3,000 years, we've known of a binary system, or at least have observed something that turns out to be a binary system. Okay, uh, we've known for 3,000 years since Egyptian times that there was a star called nowadays Algol, okay, and it's otherwise known as the Demon Star. What you're seeing here is two stars orbiting each other. Okay, one of them is just focused in the center, and the other is orbiting it. And it looks a little bit weird, okay? I promise to you that pretty much all stars in the night sky are spheres, okay? <laughs> but in this case, it doesn't look like one. And the reason is because these sequence of images were uh, uh, made uh, with an instrument called an optical interferometer, okay? What that is is a sequence of optical telescopes uh, in an array, and they all look at the same object in the sky. And when you organize these telescopes in just the right way, you can get really high resolution of, let's say, a binary star. Okay, otherwise, this is almost an impossible task uh, with optical telescopes. So the reason it looks a little wobbly is because partly it's due to the atmosphere, right? The atmosphere um, causes stars to twinkle, okay? But in reality, on average, they don't really twinkle that much. Uh, and also because it takes a lot of work to take these images, uh, compile them together across six telescopes, and to interpret this sort of information. Okay, so there's a little wobbly effects going on. But overall, we get the point. Okay, that there are, there's a binary, oh, 
intuitively there's a laser pointer in this thing. Okay, great. So there's, there's a binary star system. Okay. Now this star system has been known also since Greek times or Greek mythology. It's it's uh, thought of as a demon actually, and they used to call this or they call this um, a gorgon, okay, a type of demon. And the reason they thought this was so evil and so nemesis is because uh, when you look at it, it's actually very red. And every once in a while, when one of the stars uh, eclipses in front of it, it just dims for a moment and then rebrightens again as the star passes through. So the Greeks uh, thought that this star was a demon because it's, it's just like a big red eye floating in the sky. And every three days or so, it turns out, it blinks at you. Okay? So it's a little creepy. Okay? Um, and so, okay, so uh, binary stars exist. We've known this one for a little while. And the real question is, is, are there binary stars elsewhere? Or how many binary stars are there, really? Okay. And so to try and answer this question, it turns out to be very difficult to take, let's say, this optical interferometer, which takes, um, it's very expensive to have six telescopes. It's very difficult and finicky to have these telescopes all lined up to look at just one star. And we have to try and do this for every star. Okay, it would take some time. So instead, what you could do is do what the Egyptians did, and what the Greeks did as well, this is that instead you can just look for stars where they eclipse each other. Okay? You can look for stars like this. So here's uh, two stars. There's one star and there's another. And uh, let's say we put our camera and we point it over this star system. Okay? Chances are we're not going to resolve it. And what I mean by that is, is that they're in the camera there's going to be one big pixel that's going to cover this entire region of space. Okay? I'm going to represent the pixel here. Here's one CCD. And so when one of the stars crosses or eclipses in front of the other, you're going to see the CCD pixel dim just a bit, right? And as it passes through, it's going to rise back up. So you'll see little blinks, okay? And then when the star goes behind the other star, as it orbits around, it's going to dim again and rise again, okay? Um, this technique is called the transit method. And actually, it's more commonly known, uh, uh, or the most popular technique, really, for exoplanets, okay? So when, whenever you hear about an exoplanet, the majority of them have been found by using this technique. What you do is you wait, okay, for a planet to transit across the star, and the CCD pixel will dim just for a moment, okay? And then when it goes all the way around and comes back, okay, it's going to dim again. And so you can both look for stars, okay, stars, and exoplanets orbiting other stars, okay, with a single telescope called the Kepler Space Telescope. It's something that floats in the sky, it just stares at one spot in space, and just honestly just looks and just watches things just dim just a fraction of a percent, okay, even less than that. So I think it's a millionth of a percent. It just bloop, 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 bloop. Okay, it just stares constantly for weeks, days, months, years, okay? And as a result, you can compile all this information and ask how many stars have, or in pairs, or in binaries? And the answer is actually very profound, I think um, a little bit stunning, is that half of all stars turn out to be in binaries. Okay? And to me, when I hear that fact, that information, I can't help but realize that when I've been counting stars in that sky, I've been missing, you know, one every twice I've been counting. I've been missing every other star, in fact. I've been miscounting. Um, and so the net result from uh, the Kepler Space Telescope is that binaries are actually very common. It makes you wonder why our sun, or our uh, solar system, doesn't have a binary. Right? Maybe it's just chance or circumstance. Well, um, I'm, oh, well, I'm very uh, ambitious at times, especially when I'm trying to do astronomy. Uh, and I want to try and figure out, let's say, whether or not we can go find one. Okay? Why don't we just go and find another star and steal it and capture it into our orbit, and that's how you get binary. Okay? It's a little bit aggressive. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I don't know if there's life on that other planet, that we, uh, other star system that might not be so happy if we go about taking their star. But why don't we just go try anyways? Okay? We can try and calculate uh, what's the likelihood this would occur. But before we do that, let's get some context. Okay? So the closest star that we could steal is Alpha Centaurus. Okay, it's 4.2 light years away. What that means is that it takes light, the fastest thing that we know, 4.2 years to get there. Now stars actually move, okay, a little bit randomly in the sky. And if it so happened that our solar system, or our sun, okay, which we actually can't tell which way to go, okay, but if we could tell it to go to Alpha Centaurus and say, go there, it would take about 15,000 years at the speed that it's going at. 15,000 years feels like a long time, 
and it's a little bit too long for me. Okay. But in astronomical terms, or in context, it's not very long at all. Okay, so you might think, eventually, our sun could bump into another one. But uh, there's another aspect of this problem that's quite difficult to solve. Okay? And it's this, is that you need to go on such a direct, or let me, what's one way of phrasing this? Is that the trajectory that the sun must go on needs to be on such a direct course towards the other star. Okay? To the point that you can actually get the other star within roughly around the solar system. And uh, it, it, unfortunately, okay, solar systems are very small okay, <laughs> compared to the amount of space in between stars. So what, so what might actually happen is instead, we'll probably just barely miss Alpha Centaurus if we're off by just a little bit, but maybe we'll bump into the next one if we wait another 15,000 years. Okay, chances are we'll probably miss that one too, and we're going to have to wait and try and hit the next one. Okay? And if you do this sort of math and ask yourself, when will we actually hit one? It would be about roughly the age of the universe. Okay. Um, or another way of phrasing it is this, is that the chances of our sun bumping into another star, just randomly, okay, is the same as having two snails randomly placed on the Earth okay, and having them happen to bump into each other. Okay. <laughs> it's a very small probability. Okay. In fact, it probably won't happen. And you're left sort of sitting there wondering, how can half of the stars in the night sky be in binaries? And yet, stars will never interact with each other. Right? How can you reconcile between these two facts? The only way um, is to actually ask yourselves, where do stars come from? Right? Maybe the binary companion or the friend that they had was there all along since the beginning, and that they were born with uh, a companion. And so what you can do is instead, oh right, okay, what instead is look for a nest. Okay, a nest where stars are born, or where snails are born, okay? And you can see that there are a lot of snails in one place, and maybe one of the snails will find another snail and be its companion, and then they'll just leave the nest and carry on with their lives forever as they explore space. Okay, maybe that's uh, how binaries are formed. And so what you can do is you can go and look in a galaxy. This is the Andromeda galaxy, the closest massive galaxy to our own. It's otherwise known as that galaxy that's on every single Apple laptop and computer. Okay, and uh, this is the closest galaxy, and galaxies form stars. So maybe we can look over here, and if we want to try and find out where stars are formed, it's actually not too, it's, it's actually quite difficult, right? There's lots of, you see all this blue and yellowish sort of things and pink sort of glow. Okay, that's not just light just swimming around and scattering, let's say, through clouds or whatever. All this glow, okay, is actually formed by stars. Okay, there are so many stars there that you can't resolve them. In fact, they just look like one big fuzzy glow. And so if you wanted to figure out where stars are born, okay, it's actually difficult to pierce through here um, in, uh, pierce through here. Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> pierce through here. Uh, we have to try and look at the galaxy in a different way. Okay, so right now we're looking at this galaxy in the optical. The optical, what I mean by that is, is the same frequency as light that you can see and I can see. Red, orange, yellow, blue, green, and this one, violet. Okay, all of those frequencies. Okay. Instead, we can try and look at the galaxy a different way. Um, for example, let's say you put on your x-ray goggles. Okay, you just put on your x-ray goggles and you looked around the room. You would notice that there's a bunch of skeletons sitting down and they're all randomly just fidgeting every once in a while. Okay, it'd be a little creepy. Right? Uh, and so we can try, but it tells you a lot of information, right? That they have skeletons, people have skeletons, and um, it come, and so we can try and look at the galaxy. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. This thing jumped ahead. Okay, we can try to look at the galaxy in X-ray, and you find out this is what it looks like. It's sort of its skeleton, okay? And it turns out there is not much there. There's lots of points of light, okay? And these points of light may be on very advanced stages of stars. Let's say one of them could be a black hole, and there's matter being thrown into the star, okay? And it generates lots of X-rays. Um, it could be coming from the center, where there's lots of X-rays being generated because the gas is so hot, okay? And maybe there are stars being formed there. That's a good indication. Um, but if you go back, you notice that there's lots of stars being formed out there. Right? Um, so we would like to see stars formed out here as well, and it might not be so clear in X-ray. Okay? So instead, we can do something else, and you just saw it, okay? is we put on our heat vision glasses, or heat vision goggles, and look at it that way. Okay? So this is what a cat would look like 
We put our heat vision goggles. Most of the heat comes from the eyes and the ears. Okay. And we can try to look at the galaxy in the same way. And this is what it would look like. Okay, it looks completely different. Right? And all of these sort of uh, nodules of gas, these sort of clumped regions of gas, that's where stars are being born. In fact, if you, look at, if you look at all these little bright spots, I don't know how well you can see it, there's bright spots, little circles or dots here, okay, you notice that they always align in places where there's clouds of gas. Okay? And these bright dots are where massive stars are formed. And they don't live very long before they explode. And so actually, when you see these bright dots of gas as well, they'll probably trace regions of where you see stars being formed. Okay. So what we can do, okay, so the stars being formed everywhere, okay, what we can do is we're going to try and test this hypothesis by taking a region of the galaxy uh, and putting it into a computer and simulating it. Okay. We can simulate it as a big orange blob. This orange blob corresponds to another orange blob over here. We simulate it as an orange blob. And this blob will collapse or move around under the force of gravity. Okay, we're just going to speed up the clock because we can't wait for Andromeda to do its thing. Okay. And so over here, this is a time in years, and you're going to see this explode up. Okay, we're going to rapidly fast forward. Um, and over here, this is just a sense of scale. So this is, um, the color indicates how dense a region is. Okay? So the more yellow or the more white it is, that means the more matter there is in that location. Okay? So initially, this is sort of the smooth blob, and we're going to turn on, oh, I have to use the mouse. We're going to turn on the physics and let it go. And you'll start seeing a lot of structure being formed. Start seeing waves. And these waves have lots of mass. And this mass coalesces into larger pockets of mass. And now what it's going to do is it's going to increase the contrast. You can really start seeing dense stuff. Okay, so you see, uh, we're going to rotate. And this is a 3D simulation. Okay, and we're going to zoom in. And we're going to see streams of gas flowing into places of, uh, where there's lots of matter, very dense places. So you start seeing streams of gas. Think of them as like rain or waterfalls falling under gravity into these pockets. And you start seeing stars popping out, right? Little blobs. Okay, just going pew. Okay, and you'll notice that they always come out in sort of clusters, right? And then they get scattered off into the universe. It's gonna keep going for just a moment. So that little episode of star formation is done. But we're gonna see another one. Just reorients itself. Oh no. Oh! <laughs> Wait, hold on. Uh, uh. Why would they just stop? Why would they just stop? Oh no. Okay. <laughs> One sec. <laughs> okay. Okay, there we go. I always have a backup. Okay. Uh, okay, here. Sorry about that. Uh, is this where we stopped? I'm not sure. Okay, star has been formed. Okay. You see another episode of stars being formed over here. And we're gonna, now we're going to reorient ourselves. And I want you to focus on stars that seem to be orbiting pairs. Okay, you start seeing pairs being formed. There's a pair here. You see that? There's another pair sort of over here. Okay, these are binaries formed in our simulation. Okay, so this hypothesis seems to be working pretty well. Now the physics isn't all complete. There's still some work to be done. But at least just to test if our hypothesis is even possible, it is possible, we found out, that you can form binaries in simulations. Okay? Oh, and now it's repeat. Um, one sec. Okay. Oh. Oh no. Sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> I should have just jumped. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, I'm going to take a snapshot and you see there were a binary star being formed here, binary star system forming here. Okay. And so now, now we've shown that binaries can be made in the universe. Okay. And so given that there's two stars which have their own gravity and they're orbiting around like this, okay, you can imagine it might be a little tricky to have a planet orbit around these two stars. Okay. You wonder how can anything be stable? 
right? It seems like a bit of a chaotic system. Maybe these two stars moving around very quickly will ultimately throw this other planet around or throw it off into space, and you never form star or planets around stars, binary stars. So the next question is, do pl binaries have planets? Okay. Well, we can answer this question with a space telescope as well, okay? which is that instead of looking at exoplanets going around stars and stars going around stars, you look at exoplanets going around stars going around stars. Okay? You look for all of it. Right? You look for the really fancy stuff. Okay? And it turns out, uh, oh, so it would look something like this. Right? It would dim from the star going from the other star, and it would also have this sort of other dim as the planet goes around it too. So it's a kind of tricky observation. And it turns out there are two types of binaries. Okay, two types of let's actually solar systems that go around binaries. One is, uh, this is type one, this is called the friendly neighbor scenario. Okay? This is when two stars are really close together and you actually have a solar system around it. You have a planet orbiting around it. It turns out this is possible, we do see it. Okay, that's type one. The other type is called the dude that lives on the street scenario. Okay? <laughs> it's another star for all intents and purposes doesn't interact with uh, the primary star. Okay? And they each have their own solar system. And you know, they just respect each other from a distance. Okay, and they all around each other. That's it. So I want to explore a second scenario because I think right away this is quite profound, at least to me. Which is that if Earth had another star, but it was just orbiting and it was that dude that lives down the street, okay. Oh, I forgot I had a simulation. That's what it looked like, a little crazy, okay? If we had another star that lived down the street and it had its own entire solar system, immediately that says that if that were the case for us, we have twice as many plants to explore. In fact, we'd have another entire habitable zone where life could occur. Right? We would have another planet potentially in the habitable zone that we could go to and live. Or maybe there's life already there, and that would you know, set some problems. Okay. <laughs> right? But the thing is, is it took you know, a couple decades to have probes fly outside of our solar system. Okay? It would only take a couple decades more to send a probe to the other star system. Okay? And we could answer this problem, or answer this question, within at, le at most 50 years. Right? We could answer if life could form on other planets, and at least we could explore um, a diverse number of planets that we would have never been able to absorb otherwise at such high resolution. Okay, so that's one implication right away. The other impl implication is this. This is just sort of a, a thought experiment I made, uh, which is that if this is the solar system, and let's say Pluto is orbiting somewhere over there, okay? And let's say, and Pluto, uh, or let's say we put um, a sun, a sun that's a star that's just like our own, identical in every way, and we put it 15 times further away than Pluto. Okay, what would it look like? Okay, oh, whoa, I don't know what's going on, okay. <laughs> what would it look like? Well, here is uh, Saturn, and here is the moon, and this is one image, okay? So these are two scale you know, apparent scale to each other, okay? If the sun was that far away, it would have the apparent size of Saturn in the night sky, okay? It wouldn't be tiny, like a star. It would be resolved. And second of all, the amount of light that we would get would be just as much as the light that we get from a full moon, okay? So effectively, we would have another full moon, but all that light would just be compressed into about the size of Saturn, okay? And the rings around Saturn will correspond to, maybe not so you know, obviously, but it will correspond to planets around the other solar system. Okay? This could have been a possibility that we just weren't lucky to be born with, okay? unfortunately. So this is a nice set of scenarios. Um, there's other sets of scenarios where we found a star orbiting another binary. Okay? So this is a triple system. And in fact, uh, if you look at Algol, it turns out that's the case, is that it's a triple system. There's a close binary here, orbits every three days or so, and there's another one that orbits that. Okay, so this does occur. In fact, we found really weird systems. We found binaries orbiting binaries. Okay. In fact, we found another weird system. Okay, so far there are two solar systems here. Oh, I like uh, animations. <laughs> okay. uh, there's another so uh, system here called 30 Ari. I don't know if my friend Ari's here. Okay, but he would have loved that. Okay, <laughs> there's another system here where you have a star that has a solar system that's orbited by another star, and we don't know if it has a solar system yet. Okay, we still have to keep looking. And this binary system is orbited by another binary system that has a solar system. Okay, it's a quadruple system. Okay, so these things get pretty weird. Imagine if you lived over here, we'd have lots of planets to explore. All right, lots of astronomy to do. Um, but it just turns out we didn't, we weren't born 
that way. Okay, so this would be a nice scenario. Type 2 is great, okay? Now I'm going to talk to you about type 1, okay, which are these ones, the friendly neighborhood uh, star. Okay. Um, we'll talk about all the uh, sort of nasty things we've found out. Okay, maybe you can use your imagination to picture them, but uh, I'm going to walk through them step by step. Okay, I'm going to start with something simple here. Let's just imagine, let's go back to a system where we had a sun and the earth. Okay, this is our system now. And you know that the earth goes around and you would say that's about a day. Okay, but overall, you would say one day is when the sun goes around and comes back to high noon. Okay, it starts at high noon, goes around, comes all the way back and goes back to high noon. And you say that is one day. Okay, that's a good reference point. Well, when you have two stars, okay, which star would you choose as your reference? Okay, pick one. Just pick one. Okay, right one, left one. Okay, let's say they're identical. Okay, I'm going to take one of them. I'm going to take the left one. Okay, I'm going to stick in the center. And maybe, let's say, our planet goes around that. I don't know. Okay, and then maybe the uh, other star will go around it too. Maybe that's how planets go around each other and stars go around each other. Okay, there's a problem with the setup, which is that um, there's a there's symmetry involved, which is that um, every argument you can make for choosing this star to be at the center of the solar system, you can make for the other star to be center of the solar system, right? So uh, I could have just easily chosen the right star and popped it there too. So this answer is, is incorrect, is what I'm trying to say. Okay, what happens instead is that you have to find a unique point between these two stars. And this unique point is called the center of mass, okay? So these two stars orbit around the center of mass, Okay, and it's the only thing that stays still, and there's a sort of uh, geometric ar argument. It's the only object that stays still, and turns out the Earth will go around that as well. Okay, so in a given night sky, or in a given day, we would instead say um, that one day is when the center of mass, which we can't see, comes back to high noon. Okay, every high noon. So we have to change how we design our clocks. Okay, some of you may be wondering. Um, what would it look like if we had two stars in the sky? Okay, what would they do? I keep showing you spinning stars, okay, but what would it look like in the night sky? Or in the day, I mean. Okay. Some of you might be thinking like this, okay, and it just look like big twirling stars okay, as it just goes across the sky. A little crazy, okay? okay two flies kind of bumbling around. Okay. Um, it's actually not that simple, or it might occur, but only early on in the, form, in the early uh, life of the solar system. Okay? So here's, here's the scenario here. This is, um, uh, this is the alternative scenario, where you have two stars orbiting around each other, okay? and there's an Earth orbiting around it. And if you, that's a bird's eye view. If you took a side view, this is what it would look like. Um, actually, the Earth would go, around these, go behind these two stars, but I don't know how to make PowerPoint do that. Okay, <laughs> so just pretend, okay? So if you were on this Earth, at any uh, given point on the ends, let's say, the force of gravity would be inwards, okay? And that ultimately pulls you back, okay? And you would go around, kind of like a spring. It is a really simplified picture of how uh, uh, stellar mechanics works, or how gravity works, okay? Here's a different scenario. This is a scenario that you need, okay? The Earth has to be misaligned with the stars orbiting each other, okay? In order to see something, oh, see something like this. It needs to be above the plane so you can see two stars orbiting. Okay? Does that make sense? You need to be in the bird, you need to be a bird, okay, above the plane. So here it is, okay, but this is a really crude picture and if you, you can ask me after what the real picture would look like. Okay? But this is a really crude picture is that on average, okay, the force of gravity is inwards between these two stars but as the Earth goes across the plane, it gets a slight tug towards one star than the other. Okay, we get a tug that way, if it's over here. And the other end, you get a tug in the opposite direction. And over time, as the system evolves, okay, this entire plane will slowly shift towards something that's neutral, where you have no more tugging across the plane. Okay? Okay, maybe. So it might be like this initially, but in the end, it should, theoretically, look something like this in the end. So, in the, so what you would see is not the twirly things, uh, two bumbling bees across the sky. Okay, you see something like this. Okay. Oh. Okay. So you wouldn't see twirling. You would just see two stars overlapping each other and then and then going back to the way they were. Okay. Let's just watch it one more time again. Sorry. 
Oh, no, it's, can I use this? Okay. And when these two stars overlap, it'd just be like the Kepler Space Telescope, okay? And you get an overall dimming because one star is, blocked, is blocking uh, the light from the other star. And so as a result, you would have these phases. Okay, there would be a moment in the day where you would just call this the hour of the eclipse or something, and all of a sudden the brightness of the entire sky would drop. Okay, in this case it would be a factor of two if there were two suns. Okay, there are a lot of other scenarios. All the ones I described to you before were sort of geometric things. It's how do you put stars and how do you make them move around and then, I don't know, I mean, what do we get? Okay, there are other scenarios that we've seen in Kepler, okay, that are quite bizarre. Okay, first is this. This is that um, it turns out stars, most stars, orbit in a, can be described as, let me say this, most stars are orbiting in a close binary, orbit in this fashion. Okay, it's called the ellipse. I kept saying eclipse during my practice time. <laughs> okay, it's an ellipse, okay? And uh, the way gravity works, okay, is, is that um, if I have two objects that have mass, and I bring them uh, to half the distance, okay, I bring them twice as much close together, the force of gravity between them would amplify by a factor of four. Okay, it goes as a distance squared. So I bring them close together, the force of gravity goes up by a factor of four. If you look at this drawing, okay, the distance here, let's say that's one, then over here you can fit one, two, three, four. Okay? So when this star gets really close to the other star, the force of gravity between them amplifies by a factor of 16. Okay? And then this star runs away again. And as a result, imagine actually, um, if the force of gravity beneath you just amplified by a factor of 16, and then it just went away again. Okay, you just became 16 times heavier. Okay, you weighed over a ton, probably. Right? Just for a moment. Okay? <laughs> now imagine that for the sun, or a star. What happens is you get this sort of strange gravitational drum beat. Okay, so when these two stars are close together, the gravity amplifies very rapidly for a moment, and it's like a drum beat. And as a result, you can actually make the other star oscillate and wobble. Okay? And so these are called heartbeat stars because when you look at the total light that's being emitted, right, you just stare at them like with Kepler, you'll find out that it looks something like this. Okay, this is time, okay, and this is just the relative brightness. You know, so on average, nothing is happening, but when the two stars get really close together, they spike up. There's a net brightness, okay, or amplification, and then it also dims just a bit. And then you wait and wait and wait, and when the two stars are together, it brightens and dims again. And the authors of this paper called these heartbeat stars because it looked exactly like you know, the heartbeat signal in one of those monitors. So in the night sky, if this happened, okay, it looks something like this, is that every once in a while, these stars will just randomly just kind of blip, okay, and sort of shimmer for a moment. And then when the stars go away from each other, Okay, I'll just go back to normal. So this is a heartbeat star. Another scenario is called, what I call the spinning peanut scenario. Okay, this is when you take two stars and bring them so close together that their surfaces actually touch. Okay, and actually you just have one surface connecting the two stars. And this is uh, more formally called the contact binary scenarios because these stars are in contact. But I think they look like peanuts. Okay, and they're, and uh, I want to just tell you that when you take two stars and you bring them close together, okay, you have to spin up the star. Oh, no, I have a better way of explaining it. Okay, let me say it this way. Okay, which is that when you have a figure skater, okay, and they're spinning, when they bring their mass towards each other, or towards themselves, okay, you notice that they spin up, right? And then they slow down when they expand back out. So when two stars are really close together, Okay, they'll start to spin up and move faster and faster. So in a given day, you're just going to see peanuts okay, spinning around okay, as it goes across the sky. And so overall, you're just going to see brightness and, brightness and dimness over and over and over and over and over and over and over again okay, throughout the day. It's like clouds, except with stars. Okay, it's a little strange. Um, that's the peanut scenario. The next scenario involves a little bit of uh, knowledge about how our sun will evolve over time. Okay. If you don't know this, uh, there's some, I got some breaking news for you. Okay. It turns out in about 4 billion years or so, the sun over here is going to expand and blow to such an enormous size, okay, called a red giant. And it's such an enormous size that the surface or the earth will actually probably graze across the surface of the sun. And then after 
and if it survives, it'll probably, or no, what's the way I want to phrase it? Is that when it grazes across the surface of the sun, you can imagine that uh, it won't stay there for very long. It's like when you, let's say, bike, and you experience you know, air being blown across you, and it'll slow you down. The planet will be slowed down by drag, and then it'll just fall into the star, and then we'll just go into a fiery hell. Okay. <laughs> this, is, this, is literally, this is literally the future. Okay? And this is why we need to leave now. Okay? Or think about it. Okay? This will happen. Okay? And after the red giant phase, you're going to see a different phase called the white dwarf phase, where pretty much the star has thrown away most of its, not most, but a good fraction of its mass. And the star that's remaining, that's in the center over there, is about the size of the Earth. Okay? So there are these, but the point is that there's these three phases. One is the sun. The next phase is when it just bloats itself and expands, okay? And then it's going to throw away all that bloated garbage, okay? And then be left with this white dwarf. I just want you to remember those three moments, okay? So what would be the next phase? Let's say one of the stars just bloats, okay? This is called the overflow phase, okay? So we have two stars orbiting each other. And so one of the stars, let's say this one, starts to enter the red giant phase. It's going to expand, okay? If there was no other star orbiting around it, it would just keep expanding and engulf everything. Okay, but that's not going to happen. Okay. In fact, it's going to expand up to this size. Okay, it won't expand much more. Or it can't expand much more. And it's because of this dot I've drawn here. This is where I've drawn the center of mass. So imagine if you're standing here, okay, and there's two stars of equal mass. Ooh, two stars of equal mass. Okay. If you were standing there, the net force of gravity on you would be zero. And it would just require a little push for you to fall left or right. Okay? It's the perfect pivot. So when a star expands, it wants to expand to a larger and larger size. But when this gas starts to cross over the center of mass, it's going to actually fall into the other star. It's like filling up one bucket of water and then dumping it into the neighboring bucket of water. Okay? So you start exchanging mass, actually. Okay. Oh, okay. So this is what it looked like. It was just start dumping gas into the other star. And this is sort of an artist's representation, okay? This is gas leaving this yellow star. For us, it would be a big red star. And it would dump gas into a neighboring star. And the way I think about this scenario is, is, is a lot more simple, okay? It's something like this, okay? It's Homer just throwing all of his garbage into the neighbor's yard, okay? And just pissing the other one off. So this is called the overflow phase. What would it look like on the Earth? It would look something like this first, okay? The red giant would be red. So we wouldn't see any other colors of light. Okay, yellow, green, blue, all the things that ultimately add up to white. Mm -hmm. The entire sky would always be red. It would always be in perpetual sunset mode. Okay? And it would look something disturbing like this. Okay, there would be this huge accretion disk, and there's this huge star. Okay, and the, this big swirling disk and the star just orbits around each other. Okay? It looks a little terrifying. Okay? So that's, uh, that's one phase. Uh, th we would most definitely be dead Okay, for a number of reasons I won't explain. But if we were to survive for some reason here, okay, there's, imagine dropping, uh, what's one way to think about it? Imagine dropping a cannonball, maybe 100 million kilometers up in the sky and just dropping onto the Earth. The cannonball would speed up and speed up due to gravity, and then when it lands on Earth, it's going to release so much energy, it'll cause an explosion. Okay? Now imagine trying to dump gas onto your neighbor from that height, okay, and not trying to get them angry. Okay. So it's not going to work. And it turns out, in astronomy, this is exactly the case. Okay? There's this phase called the novae phase. Well, let's imagine that your neighbor, Flanders, turns into a white dwarf. Okay? He's more evolved and he turns into a white dwarf. And now you have Homer dumping all the gas onto the white dwarf. After some time, as you keep throwing material, okay, this gas will compress and heat up to the point to actually generate nuclear fusion, or kick on nuclear fusion. And it's not a sort of gentle phase, it's an explosion. It's actually a thermonuclear bomb, by definition. Okay? So the first thing that would happen is an explosion, okay? and it would generate enough energy to make um, the sun bright, or the explosion bright about... Uh, oh, that's a weird way of phrasing it. The explosion would be as bright as 100,000 suns, just for a moment. So if you were able to survive this, uh, this long, you wouldn't anymore. The light would just completely irradiate okay, all the surrounding regions. And, you know, this is Flanders and the That's him being angry, okay? I'm almost done, okay? This is the last phase if we were able to survive this far, okay? This is the ultimate phase called the supernova. 
You can dump so much material onto the white dwarf. Okay, if you have enough mass, you just keep throwing stuff onto it. So that the whole star actually compresses and heats up to a critical level. And, when it, and it will explode. And when it does, it's going to obliterate the star. Okay, this is when the planet squeals. Okay? This is when you have complete obliteration in the entire solar system. This is just irradiated with light and mass. And it's just swept through. So, um, you know, binaries might have saved us uh, during the red giant phase. Right? You would prevent the red giant from expanding and then engulfing the Earth. But there's all these other things we have to look forward to. Okay? So it's interesting because there's two types of binaries. Type 1 is this, where everything just leads to death. Type 2 is everything leads to more exploration, science, astronomy, and all those sorts. Okay? And so it's funny how these two paths are very divergent. Um, so I'm just going to leave you with um, this more hopeful scenario. Okay? <laughs> and it's that imagine if we did have another star orbiting very far away. We would just have a lot more astronomy to talk about. We definitely have time for questions for Steven. Your hand is up first in the back there. Hey, um, after a sun becomes a red giant, yeah. let's say ours or whatever, yeah. and then it goes on its way to the white dwarf, yeah. is there any point in time where it will go back to what we know as to the, whatever it's called, the G-class? Oh, as a, as a regular sun? Yeah. No. No? <laughs> no. It's going to expand to the size of a red giant. And there's this phase which ultimately what it does is it lets go of this envelope of gas. It just lets it go and it's free. So it just lets it go and it flies off. And what's left is whatever is left in the core, which is the white dwarf. Um, it'll, it, it's irreversible. That letting go is that like millions of years? Oh, OK. So that's, you mean the duration? No, yeah, duration of the, of the expelling of. Oh, OK. I actually don't, I don't know how fast the gas would be ejected. That's a good question. But it's not, it's not instantaneous, though, right? No. Okay. It's a gradual process. Okay. Thanks, man. Yep. Question over there? If this uh, mysterious planet X was our missing binary showing up, oh. would we have to use more calculations real quick? That's an interesting question. So there is this, um, oh, I forgot to repeat things. OK. So there's, uh, there's this uh, observation or uh, interpretation <laughs> where uh, the net conclusion is that there could be another planet orbiting very far away. Okay, and now it's called planet X, or planet whatever, I don't know what they want to call it now. Planet 9, all oh, right, this is eight planets now. So that's planet 9 or something, right? And they suspect it might have 20 times the mass of the Earth. Um, 20 times the mass of the Earth is not very much, and uh, it probably won't be a star. Uh, it will probably just be a very large, if it's there, Okay, it's probably just be some type of Jupiter-like thing, or maybe just a really, really big, solid Earth-type planet. Um, but it probably won't be a star. No, we would have we would have seen it. Yeah, yeah. Just like how uh, if we did have a star like the Sun, it would be like a full moon. We probably wouldn't miss it. Yeah. Okay. Right, when you said we had the. If there's two binary stars, the one that's a red giant, yeah. the other one's a yellow star. Okay. Would that still lead to a supernova with the accretion disk being the yellow star? Oh, uh, okay. That's a really good question. So, um, when, oh, so the question is, is, let's say you have a regular star, like the sun, and the other star turns into a red giant, and it starts dumping matter into the other star. Okay. When it dumps matter, the mass of the star grows. Okay. And, and uh, it turns out it actually rejuvenates the star in some ways. You have more matter to burn. Okay? It actually shortens the lifetime. It turns out smaller stars live much longer than bigger stars. Okay? But as you dump matter into this one, uh, it'll just sort of accelerate its phase uh, to, uh, relative to where it should have been before. So okay. that's how you end up with red giant white dwarf systems? Okay, so, so uh, you can have these red giant white dwarf systems if, let's say, yellow star, red star, or red giant star, this one evolves over time, and then it lets go of its envelope, okay, and then you have a white dwarf left over, white dwarf left over, and then this star can start going over and evolving into its stage and have a red, and have a red giant phase. So that's how you can have that set up. Yeah, yeah. You're welcome. You're in the front. Uh, so why exactly is it with the heart stars when they orbit in the ellipse? Why is it that they light up? Is it that the extra gravity takes it to 
another level of fusion, or? Yeah, that's a good question. So the, so the question is, is when you have these heartbeat stars, why does the actual brightness of the star vary? Right? And the reason is this, is because, do you remember my, um, my amorphous blob thing, the oscillating thing? The net surface area that you see, okay, increases and can actually decrease if it contracts enough. Okay, and as a result, um, the amount of light that you see, it depends on how much of the star is actually ex exposed to you. So if the star is literally bigger, although it looks wobbly, but if the net amount of uh, area that's, uh, that you can see is bigger, you're going to see a brighter uh, star. Sorry? Okay. Yeah, the luminosity it can increase and can also decrease. Yeah. Ah, that's a good question. So why are binaries more common in three star systems? It's really, that's a really good question. And one, one answer could be, uh, you know, how do you phrase this? <laughs> it's hard enough to catch, let's say, another star. Apparently it's 50%, okay, probability. But to have a triple system, okay, you can imagine this way is that uh, you can treat the binary as one star system, okay? And you can treat another binary, another star, to make a triple as an independent star. So the probability, just naively, very, very naively, would be a triple system, the probability would be that at least, at most a half, but then you have to multiply it by half again, because it's unlikely to have another star going around it. Okay, so it's a binary within the, another binary. Okay, it's actually a lot lower, the probability, uh, for a lot of reasons, but yeah. That's a good question. Yeah? And I guess, uh, oh, right. like, from the beginning, you mentioned Alpha Centauri as, uh, as something that, as our choice, and then it's like, Star from, of course, not impossible. But Alpha Centauri is actually is a triple star system. Oh. And I'm actually curious on like, the idea. Oh, I should know that. I'm more of a theoretical astrophysicist, <laughs> as, it, as you know and I've trained to be. So there are just some obvious facts that I've just <laughs> I've not known. <laughs> I'll be completely honest. Yeah. That's, that's a really good question. Um, so could you ever have two stars simultaneously turn into a red giant at the same time? The setup has to be that the masses of these two stars have to be identical. If one of them is just slightly more massive than the other one, it actually evolves faster into the red giant phase. So you always have this sort of asymmetry um, between the two. Yeah. It may be that maybe one just red giant and the other one just decides to go as well. Uh, but pro probably not. Yeah. Very unlikely. Okay. All right, everybody, I'd like to draw your attention to the feedback forms you got on your way in. As a bunch of graduate students, we're very interested to hear what you thought of the talk tonight and what you might like to hear a talk about in the future. So if you can fill those out, we have a box at the front and cookies for people willing to bring them up. Otherwise, if you'd like to attend any of the additional events tonight, we've got planetarium shows meeting just through those doors over there. If our planetarium ambassadors can wave. You'll be meeting with Elisa and Lauren if you sign up for one of our planetarium shows, the first one at 9.15. If not, we encourage you to go upstairs and check out the telescopes on the 14th floor. They're also back through those doors and there will be signs to guide you up. Though, if you have more questions for Stephen, feel free to come down to the front and talk